Welcome to The Sound of Economics, the podcast by Bruegel, the Brussels-based economic think tank. I'm Giuseppe Porcaro, Head of Outreach and Governance here at Bruegel. And I'm Guntram Wolf, I'm the Director of Bruegel. And we are happy to welcome you in this second episode of The Sound of Economics Live. We are live streaming this recording and usually we would have an audience in the studio to interact with us, but given the circumstances of the coronavirus pandemic, we are recording this remotely connected from our respective homes. We nevertheless have an audience participating online. Our listeners can ask us questions by going to the website slido, slide.do and typing the code bank, hashtag bank CV. For this live recording session, we are happy to connect with Bruegel Senior Fellow Nicolas Véron, who is joining us from Washington, D.C. Hi, Nicolas. How are you? Very good. And so I say good morning because it's still morning in America. Great. And uh, we are here to discuss the fact that the shock of the coronavirus pandemic inevitably raises concerns about financial stability and credit availability. Can banks withstand it on their own or Will they require public intervention as in the recent financial and euro era crisis? Should regulations about loan loss provisioning and capital be amended beyond steps already taken by the European Central Banks and other authorities? How can the financial system contribute to economic loss? What are the specific prospects for, for the euro area with its present lack of fiscal union and unfinished banking union? Those are only few of the questions that uh, we are going to tackle in this discussion, even if it may seem a rather technical discussion, and we're going through also some of the technicalities. As a non-expert myself, I may be asking some clarifications to both you and Guntram uh, and uh, Nicholas uh, and jump in the conversation to convey questions from the audience through Slido. But uh, to start with the general question, are we again, Nicholas, are we again in a systemic banking and financial crisis? Um, not really. We are in a major crisis, that's obvious. It's a crisis of the real economy. There is a, a shock to the economy that comes from the spread of the virus and the measures that are taken to try to stop it. Uh, this is not coming from the financial system. The financial system is affected, but there is not really an indication yet, despite a lot of uh, turmoil uh, and liquidity stresses, there is not an indication yet that the financial system as a whole and the banking system within it have stopped to function uh, in their uh, mode for which they are designed, which is to allocate credit and capital uh, in the economy. In other words, banks are still able to manage risks. They are still, by and large, solvent. Uh, we may come back to what that means uh, in detail. Uh, the capital markets are very disturbed, uh, and that's where most of the recent intervention has come uh, in, on both sides of the Atlantic. But even in the capital markets, I would say uh, it's a lot of volatility. It's a lot of turmoil. It's not complete. Uh, uh, it's not an end to the, the, the value of those markets to uh, signal uh, to, to transmit economic signal and uh, to allocate capital. So uh, a, a major economic shock, a shock that creates stress in the financial system, but not unlike what we had uh, in 2007, 2008, and later in the euro crisis, not a crisis that comes from dysfunction in the financial and banking sector. Nicola, perhaps before we talk about um, what comes next on the banking side, um, let's let's uh, review a few minutes what has happened already in the last uh, couple of weeks. I mean, we've seen um, the uh, uh, stock prices uh, around the globe plummet. Also, the stock prices of banks have come down very tremendously. Um, and there has been uh, quite a bit of worry that uh, banks would run out of um, US dollar liquidity in particular and the swap lines that were agreed between the ECB and uh, the Fed and other major central banks around the globe were immediately used. I think last, last week there was a major, a major swap line auction. Can you just 
tell us a bit what is your reading of these violent uh, market reactions and in particular the shortage of, uh, of US dollars? So the traditional way of looking at it, which is not entirely uh, inept, is to distinguish between liquidity and solvency concerns, right? Liquidity uh, means that uh, you can have access to uh, money and credit if you need it, and if you are uh, fulfill uh, conditions, particularly of solvency. Solvency is when you can no longer meet your obligations because you just don't have the uh, resources for that. And that involves a lot, solvency assessment, is uh, judgmental. It involves a lot of um, evaluation uh, decisions, uh, measurement issues, accounting issues. By contrast, liquidity uh, is something you see directly. Either you have the money or you don't have it. Uh, so there's a saying that liquidity, uh, solvency is an opinion, but liquidity is a fact. Um, we've seen tremendous stress in liquidity terms. And uh, in foreign exchange, you mentioned uh, uh, dollar liquidity pressures. Uh, there are a lot of uh, banks, but also other financial uh, market participants around the world who need dollars because the dollar has this, a central role in the global financial system. And so to access uh, dollars, they need, um, uh, because when they are not directly in the US, they need to access it from their local financial system. And that's uh, intermediated by the central bank. So the system that has been Put in place is that central banks around the world, uh, not only in the major economies like the Eurozone, Japan, the UK, but also in a number of major emerging markets, have those swap lines with the Federal Reserve. And the swap lines are a way for central banks to have access to dollar liquidity and then to transmit those dollars, this liquidity in dollars, to their local economic agent. So that has to be that has had to be mobilized uh, in a bit of a rush, and it has been a bit bumpy. But I think the system works. Uh, the US, including at least so far Congress, accepts that this is a legitimate role for the Federal Reserve uh, to provide dollar liquidity across the world. And this is going to be controversial, let's face it. There will be hearings in Congress on whether uh, the Federal Reserve is bailing out the rest of the world with dollars. Of course, it's not a bailout, but it will be depicted, depicted as such in US controversies, because that's always the case. But so far, it's accepted. And in other uh, segments of the market. On, if I may interrupt on this point, I think uh, uh, so far it has been accepted. And there was, of course, a lot of worry that uh, the US, uh, under this current administration, would not want to play that role. And so I think markets and everybody was actually quite relieved that the Federal Reserve was ready to provide all of this liquidity, uh, basically easing uh, the pressure, uh, the liquidity pressure on, on the banks. And I think we are all very happy that um, uh, these liquidity worries have been largely resolved. So I think the debate is now really shifting uh, quite a bit uh, to um, what does this real economy shock mean for um, the, uh, the ultimately the solvency of the banks and you know where the banks stand in terms of loss recognition. There's all kinds of suggestions um, that perhaps loss recognition uh, should be made uh, uh, more obscure so as to allow banks uh, to hide losses. Um, uh, but but then I mean per perhaps before we talk about these this this accounting side uh, of it, uh, let's talk a bit about. Um, uh, sort of what it really means. I mean, we have a major shock, and this shock um, will lead yeah. to probably the biggest contraction um, in GDP, um, at least uh, the steepest contraction in GDP since World War II. Yeah. This obviously means that companies um, uh, will have difficulties honoring, honoring their debt. It also means that uh, we will see... Um, uh, uh, many, uh, many other players, um, uh, individuals um, uh, see, finding it difficult to honor their mortgages. Um, governments have stepped in and have provided support, credit, credit support, also some solvency support, but still the shock is huge. And so what happens typically when you have such a shock is that um, some of the losses actually arrive in the banks. So is the valuation change that we are seeing uh, in the stock market prices of, of banks, does this really reflect um, um, the uh, the expected losses? Um, can can we see further drops in the valuation of, of stock prices of, of banks? And uh, at what stage does this become a problem where we will need to start uh, thinking about bailing out banks? 
Uh, and Nicholas, before you, you answer to, to this uh, from Guntram, still keeping on this uh, very general issue that, uh, that was laid down, I have a question from, from Slido, from Alin Orguan, who, uh, who is asking, should the market shut down if the crisis gets worse? And she also refers to, uh, to a world war, to a world, uh, world war uh, one in this case. Let's say at the start of World War One in Europe in 1914, uh, uh, shattered the exchange for four months. Is this scenario possible? It's kind of okay. linked to the, the overall global question that Guntram was posing. Okay, so lots of questions here. I think uh, we all have in mind what happened with the great financial crisis in 2007, 2008, and then with the Eurozone crisis. And uh, we're trying to see the similarities and the differences, and there are uh, some similarities. For example, we may come at some point to the discussion of what's happening in the Eurozone and the discussions about, uh, you know, the fiscal framework of the Eurozone, the role of the ESM, the role of the ECB. There are similarities there in terms of the pressures on the resilience and sustainability of the Eurozone. But the fundamental thing is a difference. The difference is where the crisis comes from. In 2007, 2008, and also during the Eurozone crisis, with a few exceptions, Greece being an important one, the crisis was coming from the financial system. The financial system was fragile. It was full of um, vulnerabilities. The banks were undercapitalized. Uh, the banks didn't manage their risk well, and this created uh, essentially the, the, the core fragilities that, that then was revealed by crisis. Here we're in a really different situation. The financial system, and particularly the banking system, is much more robust than it was in 2007, and this is because of all the reforms that were introduced after the crisis. So to put it in jargon, banks are much more strongly capitalized. They have uh, a buffers of capitals. They have buffers of liquid assets. They have a number of precautionary uh, preparatory measures that were designed exactly for this kind of event uh, to make them withstand a major shock. The shock comes from outside of the financial system. It comes from, obviously, the virus and the reaction of governments. And this shock is huge. It, it will have massive economic consequences. And then these consequences, which are already unfolding, will uh, unfold in all parts of the economy, including, of course, the financial system. But I think this sense of direction uh, and the difference in the direction of travel of the crisis, if you will, uh, is really fundamental uh, to understand what's happening. So let me come to the questions that were asked. First, the one about shutting down the markets. Uh, and also, we had on Slido a separate question about banning short selling. I think the current circumstances don't justify that. And the reason for that is that there is a lot of volatility in the markets. There are indications of stress. Uh, we already discussed a bit liquidity in foreign exchange markets. There are other liquidity stresses than the one about dollar liquidity outside of the U.S. But by and large, the very swift and resolute action of central banks, which is not only about uh, foreign exchange swaps, but a number of other programs and measures, uh, has been able, in my view so far, to provide enough liquidity that we're not seeing a complete unraveling of uh, market mechanisms and price formation and the way markets allow supply and demand uh, to meet on a number of different securities and a different financial instrument. So I don't think there is a reason at this point to close the markets because the markets are not, if you will, dysfunctional enough. Uh, their price signal formation is not uh, broken enough that it would uh, be worthwhile to break the thermometer. Markets are a thermometer for the economy. It's good to have a thermometer. The thermometer is not perfect. We know that. Uh, but, uh, but it's better to have one, even a flawed one, than uh, none at, at all, as long as there is some signaling effect that reflects fundamentals uh, in, uh, in, in, in the price. Now, coming to Guntram's questions about the banks, I think you, you, you put it well, because uh, a number of borrowers of the banks, to put it uh, very simplistically, will uh, have solvency issues. And this is going to be mitigated to a certain extent by uh, fiscal measures and government action, for example, loan guarantees, for example, uh, partial unemployment insurance, so some of the burden of paying employees 
uh, will be transferred to the government, at least uh, temporarily. Uh, for example, um, moratoriums on uh, some, uh, some uh, expenses, for example, rents. Uh, but all of this will not be uh, absolute, and, and, and there will still be businesses for which the loss of revenue from the crisis and the crisis, uh, the, the pandemic fighting measures uh, will be greater than whatever cost savings they can make, either by cutting costs or by uh, benefiting from government assistance or books. And therefore, there will be an impact uh, to the banks because they will get more loans or assets that will not uh, be reimbursed or not yield uh, as uh, initially expected. And that means losses. So how have uh, regulators and uh, supervisors responded to that? They have responded quite proactively. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to limit myself for a moment just to the Eurozone, but similar measures have been taken elsewhere in the US, in the UK, in Switzerland, and elsewhere in the world. Uh, the ECB on March 12th, so already almost uh, two weeks ago, has decided to provide the banks capital relief, by which I mean they have allowed banks to eat into their prudential buffers, which, as I mentioned before, have been built up uh, since the last crisis. And that's a very powerful way to absorb losses. So the ECB estimates the capital relief as about 120 billion euro in core capital. Uh, that means that the Eurozone banking system collectively can take losses up to that amount, uh, which is a very big amount uh, in terms of losses to the banks when you uh, take away all the other things that I've mentioned, such right. as, for example, government guarantees on loans, and they still meet their capital requirements. So, so I think this powerful, this powerful measure, uh, just the last sentence, is going to at least buy a lot of time. It doesn't address all the scenarios. And of course, a critical uh, parameter is how long does the lockdown last? And we know that's uh, first order. Mm -hmm. But at this point, uh, it should be enough to uh, allow all the banks to keep meeting their capital requirements. I mean, just to uh, just to uh, I think we have a lot of a lot of stuff here, and we, we should try to probably uh, have shorter shorter interventions to have a bit more uh, interaction. Um, but let me just just um, uh, try to zoom in a little bit on on the last point that you just just made, and perhaps also try to explain it uh, for our general audience again. I mean, so so I think you made a very clear statement. Uh, banks are will are and will be incurring losses because um, of the shock in the real economy, and those losses, of course, mean uh, losses um, that buy into first the profitability of the banks, and later on uh, even the capital base of the banks. Now, stock markets have already reacted very strongly to this. So the the the, the valuation of equity of banks has come down uh, very significantly. And I think the big question now is, um, and, and you mentioned that, is how much buffers uh, do banks have before they actually need to uh, need to raise new equity? And um, and you talked about these uh, these um, capital buffers, um, and if you can just uh, explain a little bit more, um, what are the capital buffers they have? I mean, is this uh, you mentioned 120 billion, if I, I if I understand correctly? Is this tier one uh, capital? Um, in other words, is it risk weighted capital or is it actual equity? And can you just sort of explain a little bit uh, to our listeners um, uh, how this would in practice work and uh, and what the ECB really decided? Um, so so in the in the next question, we can then discuss. Uh, perhaps what it means in terms of the banking union, but let's first try to un to unpack a bit the mechanics here. That's right, and, and you're right. Uh, all of this is not entirely simple. Uh, and one uh, driver of complexity is that there are different measures of a bank's capital. There's a market measure, which is uh, the market value of the bank's uh, equity or stock. And as you mentioned, that decreased a lot as markets anticipated that losses would eat into that uh, capital base, but also possibly force the banks to raise more capital that would dilute existing shareholders. That's a big driver of the loss of value of the bank uh, stock price. And then there is a separate measure of capital, which is regulatory capital. So regulatory capital is something that uh, is measured and watched by banking supervisors, so public authorities, like for the Eurozone, the European Central Bank, in its 
new capacity as a European banking supervisor, which, is, which it acquired in 2014 uh, in the wake of the Eurozone crisis and decisions about banking union. And the capital requirements are set in different layers. Uh, so there is a core capital requirement, as you alluded to, which is called core equity tier one, CET1 in the jargon. And uh, that has to be uh, at least 4.5% of um, uh, total risk weighted assets. So the, the core equity tier one, if you will, is the basic most solid layer of capital and banks really need to keep that in order to uh, uh, keep their license, basically. So, so, so a bank, to, to keep their license, to, to have a banking activity, they need not only to be solvent in terms of the regulatory measurement of the balance sheet, but to have this capital base, which, is, which means their assets are better above their liabilities uh, so that they can uh, face their obligations. And then on top of this core equity capital requirement, you have a number of additional requirements, which is typically, and I'm oversimplifying here, uh, what we call buffers. Uh, for example, there is a capital conservation buffer, which was introduced into Basel III reform, which was first uh, sketched by the International Basel Committee on Banking Supervision in 2010. And that's an additional 2.5% of risk weighted assets. I'm not entering now for on, into the technicality of risk weighting, but that's a, a way to measure the total size of the balance sheet uh, risk adjusted. And then you have other buffers. For example, in some countries there were counter-cyclical buffers because times were good, so the banks were, added, uh, were asked, if you will, to put a, a few more chestnuts uh, aside. Uh, there are systemic risk buffers, there are a number of different buffers. And the same for liquidity requirements, which is, are something different from capital requirements. So what the ECB has done, and I'll stop there, is they said there are a number of those buffers, including some things that I haven't mentioned, again, it's very complicated, called Pillar 2 guidance, and the capital conservation buffer uh, of 2.5% of risk weighted assets. You can actually uh, no longer have them. You can let your losses eat into those buffers, not into the core capital requirements of basic layer, but on those extra buffers that have been built on top. And we won't blame you for that. There might be some conditions. You cannot distribute dividends or things like this, but you're, you will still be considered by your supervisor as meeting your capital requirements, whatever the uh, stock market are saying about it. It's not correlated directly to the stock price. And this, in the calculation of the ECB, freed up 120 billion of uh, equity capital. That means that th that's the amount of leeway that the uh, ECB has given to the entire Eurozone banking system. Of course, it's, it, it, it has to be uh, divided uh, at an individual bank basis, and the losses will be very heterogeneous, very different from one bank to another. But that's a lot of leeway. And Nicholas, uh, let me understand a little bit better because not being a technical person here, what you're saying basically, I mean, if I can recap and would I understand what you're saying, is that in practice, we, we have a liquidity problem. We are going to have a liquidity problem, but this should not be necessarily a problem for the financial markets because the financial markets should have enough buffers in building the system to, to deal and cope with the shortage of liquidity and that liquidity should be provided by the public authorities as uh, with fiscal stimulus or, or other kind of measures uh, that uh, could come from uh, central banks and stuff like that. Do I understand well, correctly? You, that they, do I understand you, correctly? You took, you took a number of shortcuts from a technical standpoint. Uh, I, of course, I'm trying to make shortcuts for, 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 for common people uh, or, like, or rather people that are interested in what is going right. on, um, but uh, they don't uh, are so much into the technicalities of the, of the story because I would I would say there's a difference between the markets and the banks so the financial system if you will it has a core which is linked to the transmission of monetary policy and the payment system and that's the banks because the banks are where the money is as the, as the, the saying has it and uh, they're the closest to the creation of money so they have a special role to play in the system because that's where if you will, there is the, the, the highest element of trust, and that's embodied by a number of things, including deposit guarantees. Um, and then beyond the banks, you have broader financial markets, including you know, securities markets, the stock market, bond markets, mm -hmm. uh, a number of other market segments, uh, and uh, 
connecting different jurisdictions, foreign exchange markets, we've mentioned that. And these typically are less highly regulated. Uh, you can have more losses than uh, when you put the money in the bank, uh, but you have more immediate uh, risk measurement and price formation than banks which are slowing moving, slower moving uh, beasts. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm super simplistic here. Okay, and yeah. I'm also taking My, a lot of short terms, but I was trying to, I was trying to get to the, I was trying to get to the final point, which is in the end of the day, with this crisis, there is going to be uh, things that are not going to be paid somehow. There is going to be a problem in the real economy, which uh, Guntram has been pointing out. If the banks are going to be uh, functioning the same way that have been functioning according to the rules that have been set after the euro crisis and, um, and the financial crisis of 2008, uh, basically should in the, in the banking system, uh, this should be treated as business as usual. So my question is, are we on business as usual? Do we need a business as usual approach in the financial market or are we despite these buffers being there, despite uh, the um, uh, resilience of, 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 those, uh, of, of, those, uh, of those systems, uh, we are in a shock that requires some special regulations. That's and right. This is a question that is coming also from, I mean, I'm resuming uh, and summing up uh, different questions that are coming from, uh, from the slide as well on this. And, and, and it's a very good way to put it, frankly. So basically you're saying there's a loss to be absorbed, who will take it? Yes. And what is uh, the function of the financial system in that? So I think the answer of this is a number of financial market participants will take losses and already have taken losses. There will be losses to individual economic actors, uh, people, businesses, and there is losses which is uh, mutualized and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, uh, socialized through governments. So uh, fiscal losses, tax, uh, 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 basically uh, fiscal <coughs> expenditure uh, through the national budgets. And the way these losses, and, and losses to the banks as well. Now the banks are special, and banks again are just a su subset of the financial system. The banks are special because they're directly a part of the payment infrastructure. So they uh, participate in uh, the infrastructure of money in the economy, if you will. And that's what justifies a special protection, which means that they cannot fail uh, or be allowed to fail exactly the same way as other uh, participants in the economy, because uh, we have to protect a social good, which is the trust in money, and the fact that when you uh, have money, you can trust that you will not lose it uh, out of nothing. Uh, so that's why we have deposit protection. We have special protection for banks. So, so the way the banks will participate in this gigantic loss making that we're talking about is just by being able to absorb more losses. And that's why, as I mentioned, and it's not the only mechanism, but uh, uh, regulators have allowed banks to have slightly lower capital requirements than the capital relief, the ability to eat into uh, capital buffers so that they can take some losses, but not to the extent that they would become insolvent because that would threaten trust in money. Now, uh, what that also means is that the vast majority of losses that are going to be taken, uh, not directly by individual economic agents like people and companies, will have to be uh, socialized, not through the banking system, but through uh, government budgets. So basically fiscal action, fiscal stimulus is where our collective action has to focus, uh, and that's fit and proper because that's uh, where society can think of mutualized expenses. There is an alternative view, which is you should have stimulus through the credit system, through the banking system. This is exactly what China has done in 2008. They have done a stimulus to the economy, not through fiscal expenditure, but through uh, bank credit uh, stimulation. Of course, it's a bit special because all their banks are majority owned by the state, uh, and it's a very state-directed uh, banking system, which is very different from what exists in Europe or the US. Uh, it's also not been ideal, frankly, because the fact that the stimulus was channeled through the banks has led to a lot of uh, misallocation of credit, of corruption, of unnecessary uh, losses in the system that were frankly not efficient. It, uh, I think most Chinese uh, policymakers agree that it would have been better if they had could, uh, if they could have done that, 
if they had done it through the government budget. So I, I, it's a possible alternative, but it's not something that is advisable for uh, countries like ours. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, our, our speciality, which is uh, sort of what it all means, uh, all of this in, in the Eurozone uh, and the European context. And, you know, I, I'm having, of course, already lots of debates on um, exactly this question of um, loss absorption and what it means for banking union. We've heard one measure where banking union has already proved um, beneficial. And, Nicola, you commented on that, uh, which is the fact that the ECB, as the single supervisor, uh, has given this additional leeway symmetrically to all banks in the entire Eurozone. It has therefore given certain loss absorption buffers uh, to all the banks in the Eurozone. Now, I think uh, the other big question that um, we are now discussing is um, what if losses are so big that um, actually capital shortfalls uh, will be so big that banks uh, will be uh, uh, basically uh, uh, having negative equity, meaning they will need um, to uh, bail in, uh, 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 bail in not only the shareholders, but perhaps uh, other creditors and or receive uh, public funding. Now, it is interesting in this debate um, that um, the European Commission um, has already uh, generally um, uh, agreed to uh, uh, make the state aid control framework uh, laxer, so to allow um, governments more easily to pump into, uh, uh, into companies uh, additional capital, additional uh, equity, additional subsidies. Um, this is a general measure, um, a support measure for the real economy. It's thought mostly for the real economy, but it does support um, uh, companies in the real economy and therefore hopefully will reduce the amount of losses that will end up in the balance sheet of banks. Now, um, in the case of, um, of the banks more specifically, we have, um, and uh, Nicola, we've discussed this many times, we have, uh, in a sense, we have... Um, uh, uh, an unfinished framework. Um, we have, uh, on the one hand, um, a European level bank resolution framework where, um, uh, you know, if there is uh, a public interest um, uh, to uh, resolve a bank um, as established by the systemic risk, uh, the, uh, the European systemic risk uh, super, um, resolution, uh, single, single resolution board, board by the European single resolution board, SRB. You know, at that stage, um, we enter in essentially into uh, a European resolution framework uh, where there's pretty tough bail-in rules, um, and those rules are quite difficult to, to circumvent. Now, the alternative to this is, of course, uh, to put a bank into, um, into uh, in international insolvency, and that might look, as, look like a very attractive option at this stage. Um, given that the state aid control mechanisms at the, uh, um, have been, uh, that apply to the national um, state aid have been actually made, uh, made easier. So I think we are having here um, quite an interesting moment um, and the single resolution board uh, might find it actually quite difficult uh, to, uh, uh, to say uh, when there is, even when there's a significant bank, um, to say that this is a European public interest where um, the uh, Bank Resolution Recovery Directive uh, should apply. Um, where do you see these things, Nicola? Wow, um, lots to unpack again. Um, so let me mention a few things uh, in bullet point mode. Uh, there's a role for consolidation. Maybe some banks uh, will acquire other banks, uh, maybe under gentle suggestions from uh, public authorities. We saw that particularly in the US in 2008, we may see a bit of that in the Eurozone, and that may even be a good thing. Now, of course, these are individual decisions by individual banks, and uh, there might be suggestions from uh, authorities and supervisors, but at the end of the day, the decision belongs to the banks themselves and their shareholders. There are a bunch of issues that we haven't even started to discuss about accounting and measurement. So on the accounting issues, uh, Bruegel just published a blog yesterday night, uh, which uh, discusses uh, some of the arcane uh, points about loan loss provisioning and how that plays out in the US, in Europe, uh, and where I defend the view that it's not 
again, it's not the right moment to break the thermometer. We have a thermometer let's which is... Accounting, uh, let's discuss the accounting after this because I think exactly. it's... Exactly. So, so, so accounting issues, other issues that are not strictly about accounting standards, which are about measurement of non-performing loans or bad loans. Uh, so how should banks classify a loan as bad? This is a big, big uh, con point of contention right now. The ECB has introduced some flexibility, but not too much. I think they shouldn't go too far because, again, it's about not breaking the thermometer. I think our citizens, frankly, don't want uh, authorities to give banks too much leeway to hide the bad news and then expect assistance from government. We've seen a lot of popular backlash against bank bailouts in the previous cycle, and I think there are lessons to be uh, learned there. There so are other issues, point, for example. Because it's on this point. point. Just yes. at this point, very quickly, you saw that um, a former bank supervisor, Ignazio Angeloni, uh, called for uh, supervisory forbearance. I suppose you would disagree with him. Uh, you know, forbearance is an ambiguous word. Uh, it's used by different people in different ways. Ignazio is a former colleague at Bruegel, obviously. Uh, so uh, I, I, I guess I won't directly answer that question. But, but basically, my point on this debate is that capital relief is justified. Under the circumstances, the very reason why we have buffers is for them to be used in circumstances like the current ones. But that's a very different thing from supervisory forbearance. Supervisory forbearance is coded language for supervisors uh, allowing the banks to hide losses and uh, not forcing them to recognize them and uh, have the consequences uh, in terms of regulatory requirements and, 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 and possibly uh, losing their banking license or being uh, declared failing or likely to fail in the European legal jargon. Uh, this is not the time for supervisory forbearance because citizens are expecting transparency. They're not expecting special favors to banks. And I think there is a pledge here uh, that uh, is uh, quite important. So we need capital relief probably, but not supervisory forbearance. And what that means, and I'm coming back to your initial question, if a bank is no longer uh, meeting its capital requirements, it's no longer able to meet its obligations. It should be declared failing or likely to fail. That's a responsibility for the supervisor. And if the supervisor doesn't do it for the resolution authority, so in the Eurozone, that means ECB declares the bank failing or likely to fail. And if the ECB doesn't do it, then the SRB, the Single Resolution Board, which is this new agency that was created uh, also as part of the banking union in 2015, uh, if the ECB doesn't do what they have to do, the SRB can uh, also declare a bank failing or likely to fail. Now, if a bank is failing or likely to fail, and we had a handful of examples in the last few years, then, as you mentioned, there's a complicated decision-making arborescence that may send the bank into either resolution under EU law or national insolvency. Sadly, and here I will be a bit more critical than you have been in your question, Guntram, this... Um, system doesn't work well. And that's a, a very uh, sad statement to make now, but the framework of bank resolution that was embodied in the Bank Recovery and Resolution uh, Directive of 2014 is not working as intended, particularly in the Eurozone. Uh, so how that will play out in this crisis in the next few weeks, I have no idea. But one thing that I know for a fact is that this episode should provide a greater sense of urgency in making the system work, making resolution work as initially intended by our legislators uh, and making sure that indeed, uh, at least in individual cases of bank failures, we have no need for taxpayer money. We have creditors bearing the losses. That's what the jargon calls a bail-in. And then in a systemic crisis, we can think about what exceptional ma measures may be needed. But it's a, it's a sad reflection that this system that was introduced in principle back in 2012, here we are in early 2020, it still doesn't work as intended, uh, and uh, now we're meeting another uh, massive crisis without having the right preparation. So I think here, of course, now is not the time to discuss long-term structural reform, but there should be uh, a memory of that, so that when times go back to somewhat normal, as we hope they will uh, yeah. get back at some point, new energy is put into this effort on which there have been a lot of discussions over the years, but no decisions of making resolution work and completing the banking union. 
And Nicholas, there are a couple of questions on this. I mean, we are we are covering questions that are uh, being asked on Slido, but um, there was there was a question about the European Banking Authority announcing today, on 25th of March, uh, and that looks like banks will have enormous flexibility on recognizing forbear forbearance loans, reducing transparency. Uh, this is uh, going a little bit in you know, in the direction, in an opposite direction of what, what you were just saying, I suppose, and uh, how this resonates with what you're saying. And uh, also maybe a couple of words about uh, accounting standards, because there is also this other debate about the accounting standards and uh, should they be relaxed or shouldn't they be relaxed? And they are kind of connected. Um, I'm aware of the statement of the European Banking Authority, but I haven't read it yet. Uh, it's the morning in the US, as I said, and uh, things are moving too fast for me. Um, so I'm not going to comment on that statement, but I'm going to comment on the uh, accounting standards uh, indeed. Uh, the, there's no way to have a perfect standard, a perfect thermometer for loan losses. Uh, there are two different concepts, incurred losses, which we had before the great financial crisis, and expected loss provisioning uh, that uh, was introduced in the wake of the great financial crisis with standards that were issued, uh, I think, in 2013 by the International Accounting Standards Board and in 2016 for the US equivalent because the US is still, has, still have their own accounting system. Um, so now we have a system which is called expected loss provisioning. Uh, again, none of these systems is perfect. They both create what economists call procyclicality. Um, in different circumstances, so they, there is a risk that they may exacerbate market perceptions when losses uh, either start becoming uh, forecast in expected loss provisioning or start actually happening in incurred loss provisioning. Uh, my point here is very simple. We have made a collective choice, in this case for expected loss provisioning, as a result of the last crisis. Is that an ideal me method? No, it isn't, and no method is ideal. But now is not the time to break the thermometer to change the standards in a hurry. Uh, so, so it is important. I'm, I'm not making a pro forecast here. I don't know what will happen, but I think it's important that the tremendous political pressures and the lo bank lobbying is relentless. Um, the pressures to break the thermometer to change the accounting standards in a rush are enormous. They should be resisted. Right. Why? Because it's a matter of public trust. We have seen that uh, bank lobbying is generally misguided when it comes to accounting measurement and capital. Banks have spent a decade lobbying against Basel III. Now, thanks God we have Basel III. Basel III is exactly the reason why we can provide this capital relief uh, that is so important given the circumstances. So Basel III was exactly the right thing to do. We know it now from absolutely critical experience. The same applies to accounting standards. After the crisis, it will be time to revisit this and have an honest debate on whether at the end of the day, maybe it's better to go back to incurred loss provisioning. But now is not the time to do this. And now uh, we should just apply the standards we have as honestly as possible, as transparently as possible, not listening to uh, lobbying from banks because they have been proven in recent times not to be uh, given advice in the public interest. So, Nicola, I mean, uh, let's let's get a few questions from the audience because we are actually already having 39 questions on Slido. So, so let me just read one question, and you you discussed it already uh, shortly, but I think it it deserves a bit more elaboration by uh, Jack Schickler uh, from Amlex. Uh, he's saying EU banks were already weak and in need of consolidation before the crisis. At what point should regulators? Uh, again, allow mergers and resolution uh, resolutions uh, to happen. Um, so, can you can you say a, a few words? Are we about to see a big uh, consolidation wave uh, of banks in Europe? And is isn't the incomplete uh, banking union framework that we also discussed um, actually an obstacle to this now? Absolutely, Guntram, you're right. I, and I think there are two levels here. One is the legislative level and the, the discussion on completing the banking union. And as I mentioned, there's been a lot of debate about this in a number of groups of the ECOFIN uh, Council and, and subgroups. And there has been progress, but no decision, uh, particularly in the last 12 months. So I think this, uh, what's happening now, should inject a sense of urgency into that decision. It's not the most urgent discussion because it's a legislative thing, it will take time. Uh, there are more urgent issues in terms of fighting the pandemic itself, but as soon as we go back to a kind of normal mode, 
there should be new energy into discussion about completing the banking union, which can be done without treaty change, without fiscal union, without anything particularly radical, but it's politically difficult. So, so there should be focus on this, and I expect that the commission, Commissioner, uh, Vice President Dombrovskis, and others uh, will put a lot of their uh, focus into this, uh, into rest of the year, not the immediate next days or next weeks, but uh, in 2020. Now, there is something more immediate, which is uh, what's going to happen to the system in terms of structure, and you mentioned cross-border consolidation, you mentioned resolution banks either being uh, purchased by others or by equity investors, for example, private equity, uh, or uh, being uh, closed down uh, through a resolution or liquidation process. And here, I think indeed the Eurozone banking crisis sector is still fragile. As I mentioned, it's properly capitalized, which is important and wasn't the case 10 years ago, but it's not profitable enough. There are too many banks uh, and uh, th this is a sector that is crying for restructuring and rationalization and consolidation. So I agree with that. And probably things will happen in uh, the months ahead. I don't know exactly what, but it's uh, likely that this crisis will uh, create an acceleration effect. Here. Now, when it comes to resolution, I think it's important that we get back on track to what was intended by legislators when they drafted and voted the RRD, the Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive, and that we get the resolution system to function as much as possible as was initially intended. And that's very difficult in a crisis, but I think it's also important. So if you want a, a parallel, there was an episode of that nature in uh, September, October, early October 2008, with this big battle between the US Treasury and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corp Corporation on a bank called uh, Washington Mutual. It was actually a, a stress, but basically like a bank. Uh, a big, big institution, $300 billion uh, balance sheet. And so FDIC was saying it has to be closed according to the rule book with losses to the creditors. And the Treasury was wary of that. So FDIC won that day. Creditors had to incur losses. It was the right decision to make. So we need something like that. And I think this, is, this puts a high onus of responsibility on the single resolution board because that means that maybe the single resolution board will have to revise their recent practice and accept that banks are public interest institutions even when they're not super big. Uh, sorry if that's a bit of jargon. No, no, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and really think in terms of how we can have a sustainable mechanism that makes resolution work as our legislators uh, wanted it to work uh, when they uh, voted uh, the current legislative framework. So, so we have to, uh, to uh, come to three very quick last questions and please uh, let's try to give very short answers to those. Uh, but I think it's, it's important to actually take those three questions. So, so the first one is um, uh, by uh, Mr. Anonymous, unfortunately, but it's still an interesting question. There is a mounting debate about the fact that banks should stop share buybacks and do not distribute dividends on 2020 results. Um, so is it time to, uh, for, the, for the supervisors to tighten the screws on, uh, um, on shareholders and on, uh, on bank management? Yes, and, uh, and, and, but, but it's even better if the banking sector comes to that conclusion itself. And there are current discussions, uh, for example, within the European Banking Federation, according to the media, um, uh, that are ongoing as we speak about exactly this. So in Sweden, for example, supervisors have said, you know, no more buybacks, no more dividends for the time being. In the Eurozone, we're not yet there, but I think it would be absolutely appropriate for banks to take leadership here collectively, say we're withholding dividends, we're actually cutting bonuses for executives, uh, that would be the right thing to do, also in terms of their uh, image in a broader society, uh, and uh, certainly stopping dividends and uh, absolutely stopping buybacks. Uh, this is not the time to give the money back to shareholders, it's the time to keep the money uh, to build up capital and be able to absorb losses, because there will be losses. So a second question by Jeroen, Jeroen Peers from the Treasury of Belgium is, what role do you believe public guarantee schemes on short-term loans from banks to firms in trouble could play in guarding confidence in markets and in banks? Yeah, uh, there are a lot of public guarantee schemes that have been announced in different member states and also outside Europe uh, in recent days and weeks. And I think this is absolutely appropriate given the nature of the shock. So these uh, public guarantee systems, loan guarantee systems, uh, should be recognized uh, as much as appropriate by supervisors. So when a loan is 
guaranteed and misses a payment that should not necessarily become a known non-performing loan. There are a lot of technical and difficult questions here, so I'm not entering into the details. But I think this exactly echoes what I was saying before in response to Giuseppe. A lot of the burden has to be taken by uh, governments, by the budget, by fiscal action. Loan guarantees are of that nature, and they should be allowed to work also in terms of measurement of losses in the bank accounting and regulatory system. So then I see two questions, actually, and uh, I think I will take those two um, uh, on um, the uh, inflation eff effects of uh, current monetary stimulus. Um, so two people worry. One person here says, do you fear that rising inflation rates, uh, that inflation rates will rise because production output is going down and money is funneled into the system through central banks? Um, I think my, uh, my take uh, about this question at this stage, but it's of course a big debate, um, is that uh, we are currently seeing a both a supply effect, but we see an even bigger demand effect. Uh, in other words, I don't see um, inflation uh, really increasing at this stage. Uh, on the contrary, I would rather expect inflation to probably go down because of the second round demand effects that are so much stronger than the supply effects. And uh, in principle, I don't think um, if we can reopen the economy relatively quickly, I think we will relatively quickly be able to um, uh, resume production uh, while demand will probably for quite some time lag uh, behind because basically households um, and companies will want to make up for the losses that, that they have, uh, have incurred. Um, perhaps let me, uh, Nicola, uh, ask you uh, from my side, uh, from uh, one, la one last question here from uh, from the audience, um, and I don't know if Giuseppe has one after that, but, but a person called Frédéric asked a question that I think you will enjoy. Um, uh, is the close link between banks and governments, which caused the turmoil in 2010-11, sufficiently addressed to avoid a repeat this time, or is it not? Uh, the answer is it, it's not. Uh, we know that the bank sovereign vicious circle has not been broken despite the pledges at the highest level of political leadership uh, repeated several times by our uh, heads of state and government. And this is exactly what I was referring to before in our conversation when uh, saying it's time to uh, put new, new energy into debate about completing the banking union. Completing the banking union and breaking the bank sovereign vicious circle from my perspective, are exact synonyms. They mean the exact same thing. And that's logical because the banking union has been defined by our leaders when they started it in 2012 as uh, an imperative to break the vicious circle between banks and sovereigns. I quote uh, repeated declarations. Um, so that's politically very difficult, but it's not impossible. As I said, it doesn't require fiscal union or no further steps towards fiscal union. Um, it doesn't require treaty change, but it requires things like limiting um, the uh, concentrated exposures to sovereigns on bank balance sheets. It requires things like European deposit insurance. And critically, it requires what I mentioned before, which is making the resolution system work. At least when there are isolated cases of banks failing, they shouldn't uh, need to require uh, taxpayer money. And, uh, and, and all this is very complicated. It's a difficult discussion. Uh, it's not the most certain thing, but it should be uh, um, put as a very high level of pri priority uh, by the Commission, by Mrs. van der Leyen, by Mr. Dombrovskis, uh, by uh, the different um, uh, authorities and institutions as soon as they can get back to legislative work. Well, I mean, let me just say on this question how much uh, fiscal union we need to complete banking union. Uh, we have lots of debates and also uh, lots of disagreements within Bruegel. Um, and uh, I guess you and I, we also have some different views. But I think it would take us too far away from in this podcast to discuss that. So I think uh, uh, Giuseppe. Yes, is, uh, indeed. I was about to say that uh, as a last as a last link, it's exactly this that uh, we come back to the square of the circle that uh, there is a an extreme, uh, an extreme um, uh, link of, of this discussion to the discussion about the fiscal policies and, uh, and what to do in this very moment at the European level, which is something that is an ongoing debate uh, and that we at Bruegel are taking uh, over on many different uh, occasions now in those, in those days of uh, coronavirus emergencies in different blogs and uh, other events and uh, uh, further uh, podcasts the live that we're going to do in the in the coming days on on this topic so i just wanted to say that this is not a close conversation and that we cannot uh, uh, exhaust uh, 
all the questions uh, in, in this uh, amount of time, but uh, I wanted to thank uh, Nicolas for having joined us from the other side of the Atlantic. And the recording, the recording will be made available uh, because I see a lot of people asking that question. We will have a full recording uh, of this podcast um, as well as of the live stream um, available on our website. Uh, yes, exactly. And so thanks uh, for our listeners and uh, all the participants that joined remotely and actively asked questions. You may find uh, specifically a blog post by Nicolas on the very same issue that we debated today in this episode of, uh, of the Sounds of Economics Live on our website, www.brugel.org, alongside all the podcasts and publications. So thank you very much. Stay tuned with the Sound of Economics. Until next time, bye-bye. Bye-bye and stay safe. Thank you. Bye.